This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show made possible by its listeners. Thanks to every single one of you, including Audrey Stoll Adler Spot, Dale Mulcahy, Matt Zaglin, Ariadne, whose shout out is sponsored by Kevin from Milwaukee, and new patron Tassos. Welcome in, Tassos, everybody. Hey, Tassos. Yay. On this episode of DTNS, have chips hit rock bottom? The robot vacuum you've been waiting for, and the streaming TV consolidation melee is about to begin. And it's Disney's fault. Actually, it's Comcast. <laughs> On this episode of DTNS, have chips hit rock bottom? Yes, that's right. I already read that line. This is the Daily Tech News for <laughs> Thursday, October 2nd, 2023, in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Secret Bunker, I'm Sarah Lane. From deep in the heart of Texas, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And it's not his fault that I did that, by the no, way. It's just probably the Halloween me. candy. No. It's no one's fault, okay? Nobody's it's all the, fault. All the, all the no almond joys. Nothing's ever anybody. It was Ghirardelli Minis this year for oh, us. Oh, nice. Yeah. All right. Let's start with Quick Hits. <laughs> Back in July of this year, the Norwegian Data Protection Authority imposed a temporary ban on Facebook and Instagram conducting targeted behavioral advertising. Now, the European Data Protection Board has instructed the Irish Data Protection Commission to extend that ban to all of Europe in the next two weeks. Meta, which owns Facebook and Instagram, is under Irish jurisdiction in Europe. The company has also been fighting these decisions in court. The first independent benchmarks of Apple's new M3 Max chips have started showing up on the Geekbench 6 database. The highest Geekbench multi-score, multi-core score for what we're pretty sure is a 16-inch MacBook Pro with the 16-core CPU is 21,084. That number is real close to 21,316, which is the average score for the M2 Ultra, which is in the Mac Studio. Now, that's Max and Ultra. When you compare Max to Max, the M3 Max looks to be testing at around 45% faster than the M2 Max, which is pretty close to what Apple said. Uh, if you want more on this, check out Roger Chang's column in our Patreon, patreon.com slash DTNS. Speaking of Apple, the company discontinued the $5 per month Apple Music Voice Plan that let users access the entire Apple Music catalog exclusively through Siri. Code references in iOS 17.1 beta suggested that the Apple Music Voice Plan was being discontinued, and now the website has been taken down and redirects to the main Apple Music page. The adoption of Passkey continues. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, they're like, wait, what's that again? Uh, Passkey is the token that uses your devices and your biometrics to authenticate you instead of you having one, two, three, four, five, six as your password and a text message that can be intercepted. How'd you uh, know? <laughs> I got you again, Justin Robert Young. <laughs> Uh, well, if you want to avoid that embarrassment, get a passkey. Password manager Bitwarden is the latest to get on board with passkey support. It is included in the 2023.10 release rolling out now to Bitwarden browser extensions. It is not, however, supported in Bitwarden's mobile app yet. Mint, once the darling of personal finance... Now closing down. Now, if you're Aww. not familiar with what Mint has been doing, Intuit acquired Mint back in 2009 and is now directing Mint users to switch to Credit Karma, which Intuit has also owned since 2020. Credit Karma lacks Mint's budget tracking tools, though, but instead a simplified way for you to build awareness of your spending and track your savings. Although Intuit says it plans to add ways to track spending and aggregate financial accounts going forward, Mint users have until January 1st, after which it will no longer operate. That yeah, stinks. It's Mint, not it Mint does Wireless. stink. I actually really liked Mint. <laughs> I like it currently. Well... <laughs> Not for long. Yeah, I guess I should enjoy say, it. I also like mint currently, but for a very, very small period of time. You enjoy enjoy fast. your last Christmas with mint, Justin. I know, I know. All right, uh, let's talk about chip makers. They're, they they look smile. Why are they smiling, Sarah? 
All right. Okay. So one theme coming out of earnings calls from chip makers this week, and there were many, is that optimism that we've reached the bottom of the PC market and fortunes are about to turn around. Everybody wants to hear that. TSMC, Qualcomm, Intel, Samsung, AMD, all indicated the worst is over for chips. It's only up from here. The optimists believe that advancements in AI will boost uh, will boost growth at the companies. Qualcomm even said in its latest earnings exactly this. Okay, so let's go let's go into who said what. Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger said the arrival of the AI PC represents an inflection point to the in the PC industry. AMD boss Lisa Su said, expected some growth going into 2024 as we think some sort of the AI PC cycle and some of the Microsoft Windows refresh cycles. Qualcomm CFO Akash Palak, uh, Palak Iwala said, we're seeing early signs of stabilization in demand for global 3G, 4G, 5G handsets. AMD had the strongest growth in two years. Intel declined, but the decline was almost flat after four quarters, where it and AMD also had larger drops. Everybody expects this to be a good holiday season, however. So, Canela says that will be uh, something that is going to continue to speed up and expect AI-capable PCs to make up 60% of shipments by 2027. Okay, so that's not right around the corner, but that's something that, you know, is, is the long con, right? So let's pour out some cold water on all this, Tom. Where are we now? <laughs> yes. Let me rain on your parade, ship makers. Uh, <laughs> A lot of the analysts look at this and feel like it's overly optimistic. They wonder where is the killer app for AI that will get, that will drive all this new PC adoption. Um, Microsoft Office is the one killer app for AI as it rolls out to enterprise and maybe eventually comes to consumers in the coming year. But is that enough? Uh, then there's the world. Uh, China-U.S. trade restrictions are complicating the markets, uh, reducing demand in some cases because you can't sell your chips to the people you used to, uh, and just generally making things harder for chip makers. Uh, interest rates are still high, and strong consumer demand is still uncertain. There's, there's a lot of reasons for optimism. There's also a lot of reasons for pessimism uh, in the economy. And then, you know, there's there's actual wars being fought in multiple spots on the planet, not just Ukraine and Israel, uh, but those two big ones certainly make it uh, more volatile that something else could happen or spread and nobody knows uh, what's really going to happen there. Uh, Justin, given yeah. this uncertain world in which we live, are the chip PC makers optimism warranted? Uh, I think they better hope that, that it is because they have a glut of them and they really want to sell them where I think that there is reasonable optimism is if we are going to understand that there's a utility to what we are throwing into the broad bucket of AI, right? That with these advancements, you're going to want to do more faster on your PC, and whether or not those are uh, these products are developed specifically for that or you have peripheral devices that are developed specifically for that, you are probably going to want something new so everything goes faster. That is one thing that is universal about any kind of machine learning uh, product, at least the, the class of which we are understanding now, is that they are resource intensive. So in that case, yes, I can see a broad trend that we will look back, that we could look back five years from now to this moment and say, yeah, it was very clear that this was going to be the case. And I agree with your perspective. We don't have it now. And I tend to be a little, uh, look a little askance at anything that is pretending to be the next big thing when we can at least see the outline of it. Yeah. Especially because so much of, of AI is cloud driven. Now, a lot of people want it to be on device. Uh, and so maybe yes. that's enough, but that's not something that's there right now. Uh, and, and yes, there are uncertainty in the economy, uncertainty in, in the, the political climate and, and, and military climate. Um, but even if you bracket that off and say, well, we can't control that, uh, 
just just looking at demand and hoping that all the other conditions hold, uh, I I don't know if if it's enough to bring a big boom. I think what they're right in seeing is that there is a turnaround. Like the 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 drop has stopped. Uh, how optimistic they should be about growth is the part where I get skeptical. Yeah, the larger problem is the idea of a recession or or some kind of big global and then there's a, yeah anything because like that. that's that's a whole thing that is totally outside of the tech cycle and just totally throws everything off exactly. Oh yeah. Well, for anybody who loves a good vacuum and a mm-hmm. robot mm-hmm. vacuum at that, uh, <laughs> robot vacuums have come a long way. Case in point, the Matic. A new robot from two former Google Nest engineers who worked on the Nest Cam IQ cameras and Nest Hello doorbell, Mahul Nari uh, Yawala and Navid Dalal, instead of sensors, bumpers, and LiDAR tech, they say they want to uh, have a robot that has five RGB cameras that can help it navigate areas with high pile rugs. Cables that need to be avoided, small spaces in general, all stuff where the, you know, uh, current robot vacuums don't always do their best work. It's also operating on device. This is very interesting. Not a cloud component. Doesn't need internet to run smoothly. Now, Matic launched using a subscription model early, earlier this year. Now is being sold on its own with discounted pre-orders. Open at maticrobots.com for $1,495. That's $300 off the regular price uh, because you're getting into it early. And delivery set for March of 2024. So you're not going to get it over the holiday season, but, you know, pretty uh, soon next year. The founders previously worked on the startup Flutter into tackling the problem of creating a truly autonomous home robot cleaner. So this is where we've landed with the Matic. Yeah, there's a lot of cool things to like about this. The Reverb Mike was asking, uh, why is it so clunky looking? And the reason it's so clunky looking is it's borrowing a page from Amazon's Astro robot. It has big wheels. It's got heft so that it can get over those large pile rugs that Sarah was talking about. And it's using computer vision. So it ne- I think it needs to be a little higher off the ground than a Roomba so that it can actually see. Because the big advantage, if you didn't catch it, is that this looks around and avoids things. It yeah. recognizes objects. It knows, oh, that's a toy. Oh, that's a pile of crumbs. And then it goes towards the pile of crumbs and avoids the toy. So it doesn't just keep running around, bumping into things going, oh, I guess a chair's here now. It can actually see things and move a little smoother. And it's more autonomous in just every couple of hours. If you want it to, you can change the settings. It'll just roll out and check things and you can talk to it. It has voice commands so you can say, go clean the bathroom bathroom and it will learn like, oh, you always like me to clean the kitchen at around six o'clock. You always like me to clean the bathroom, you know, at around 10 PM, whatever it is. Uh, so there's, there's a lot to love about this, except for the price. That's really the only thing that's a stopper because 1495 is the, is the pre-sale price. It's going to be $1,600 once it's mm-hmm. actually available in regular retail. 17, 17, oh, um, 17, 1699. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Listen, I I love my Roomba. Um, my Roomba is not the smartest tool in the shed. Let's be honest. Um, but I mean, boy, it's better than not having a vacuum cleaner at all. But I really get what Matic is going for here, saying, yeah, you know, having sensors and bumping around and you know, d- trying to map out a a a, a living room, uh, say, is fine. But if you actually have cameras, then it doesn't really matter what, you know, what maybe, you know, there's an ottoman in the room that wasn't there before. And it's not going to freak me out because I'm just use, using cameras. And part of this is utilizing the kind of uh, capabilities that we were talking about in our first segment in terms of being able to do more yeah. on device. Let me say this. If it's $1,700... Seventeen ninety five. Seventeen ninety five, and it works. People will pay for it. Uh, this has been the model of Dyson. You're gonna you're gonna spend more on it, but you're not gonna need another one. It will work. It will successfully clean your house. 
we just got our uh, first floor of our house redone with new floors. We decided to buy lighter floors because it brightens up the room. And boy, does it, gang. Here's what else mm-hmm, it does. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Shows you every crumb you drop on this something. Uh-huh. So uh, uh, we need a robot vacuum. And if this, when it rolls out, pun intended, Literally. Uh, uh, and gets the say, if, if it gets the kind of reviews that it, it is able to deliver and it doesn't get stuck and it has a, 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 an efficacy that is worth that price point, then to me, it is going to be something that will possibly live at our house it's that the big question is whether it delivers on its promise i think yes, right like that's second the to price thing. is no the verge wrote a great story about this just based on videos they have not tried it themselves no. so it really does need to deliver on the product pro- promise but i like the way they chose features they don't have it automatically empty itself they have it go to your trash can you teach it where the trash can is and it goes and just waits there because automatic emptying is unnecessarily complicated and makes this thing not work well they made it a little chunkier and less sleek looking because that means it can roll over everything and not get stuck uh, they put computer vision in instead of using LIDAR because computer vision, while harder to pull off, has gotten good enough that it's more effective. Uh, so I think this group really knows, like, these are the trade-offs to make. Uh, I feel like, you know, the fact that it can sense a spot on Justin's brand new floor and say, oh, that's cranberry juice. Let me yep. roll over that multiple <laughs> times with the mop to make sure I get it, which oh, is what my. they say it can do. Uh, that's huge, right? I'm a glutton with the CJ. Yeah, I know. You're just messy. But it's all so over the place. What are you going to do? <laughs> Why? Why must you constantly spill cranberry <laughs> juice? It won't matter in the future when you get the matic, <laughs> no. matic whatever it is. Yeah. No, I, I, I will say, never has a wire cutter review been more important than mm. whatever the review whatever is this on this device. Being. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, well, a- as you can see, uh, there's all kinds of uses for all kinds of algorithms and models and things you might call AI. And if you want to keep up just on those things, you must get AI named this show in your life. Uh, each week, Tristan Jutra and Teja Custody wade through the hype and the doomsaying and keep you informed about what's actually happening in the world of AI. You can catch it at AI named this show. I have talked a lot about a lot of things, uh, but especially on Cord Killers and DTNS about how important it'll be when Comcast sells off its remaining stake in Hulu to Disney. Yes, Disney controls Hulu, but Comcast still owns 30%. My premise has been that once that happens, the purse strings will open. And we'll start to see everybody else jumping in the pool because they're waiting to see what Comcast does with its money. Comcast waiting to get that money. Disney's waiting to pay that money so they see how much they have left. And then everybody's going to start shuffling around pieces on the board. On November 1st, Comcast pulled the trigger on this exercise, exercising, literally, its option to sell its stake in Hulu. So this isn't going to finish until January. That's why if you've heard me before, I always say in January is when this is going to happen. Disney has until December 1st to determine the fair market value of Hulu. Uh, They will determine this by having a bank appointed by each side, one by Comcast, one by Disney, agree on a number. In fact, if they can't agree on a number, those two banks get to invite a third bank in to agree on the number. So they'll agree on a number. And then Disney will have 45 days to pay off whatever that number is. The final number Disney will pay is expected to be somewhere close to $9 billion. It depends on exactly how much they determine Hulu was valued as of September 30th, but it'll be around $9 billion, somewhere probably a little south of that. Once Comcast is out of the picture, Disney won't worry about accidentally making Hulu worth too much. That's been a concern. They, they don't want to push Hulu before Comcast exercised its option. They knew that they could force Comcast to exercise its option at some point. So they've been playing a little cautious, which means once this is all done, Disney could expand Hulu overseas, which would greatly increase its value. They could combine it with Disney Plus, which, if nothing else, would complicate its value. They could sell it off to somebody else. Disney will also know just how much cash it has to spend on Hulu and therefore whether it's worth selling off any other parts of its business, uh, to which everyone says, ESPN, please sell me ESPN. Uh, Disney's Bob Iger has said he wants to keep ESPN, but 
he is considering partnering on streaming or selling a minority stake in it. In fact, you may not realize this, but Hearst owns 20% of ESPN. So 36% of it could still be in play and Disney still retain a controlling interest. B of A Global Research listed the NBA, the NFL, Amazon, Verizon, and even Comcast as possible companies interested in buying a stake in ESPN, which is basically everybody that could possibly want a stake. <laughs> so they, they don't really know. Um, Justin, yeah. Uh, are you ex as excited as I am that the starting gun has been fired and that we're about to see the streaming market just go into even further disarray? Well, I, I think actually this is the moment where we we begin the array part. <laughs> ah, yes, right. We have been in disarray. This entire process <laughs> has hung over every decision that has been made in the world of entertainment for the last five years. And we've specifically seen some of the issues come to the fore in the uh, one strike that was resolved, the WGA strike, and the one strike that's ongoing, the sag astra strike. Part of the reason why these strikes have been so pernicious is because the people on the other side of the bargaining table don't know who they're going to work for. They don't know if they're going to be a boss or an employee by the time that whatever contract that they sign, even a short one, ends. Uh, and this is why. Because as soon as – the reason why Disney was being very coy and annoying about Hulu saying, I don't know, maybe, maybe Comcast will buy us. Who knows what's going to happen is because, like you pointed out, they didn't want to drive up the price of what they knew they were going to be contractually obligated to buy. Now we're here. And from here – Everything is possible. We can see Paramount sell. We can see uh, a Comcast sell. We can see Disney sell. The big question is, who's going to buy? And right now, on the board, you've got Disney that is not in the best financial situation. There's a reason why they're looking to take on another uh, buyer in in ESPN. What was once their cash cow, by the way, an uh, interview with their old CEO said uh, John Skipper said that at the height of ESPN cable rights fees predominantly for ESPN brought in more profit to Disney than the parks and the studio combined. If you want a sense of what ESPN used to make for Disney, those days are long gone. In I my mean, mind, how long gone are they though? I know, gone. you know, well, are no. they? Oh, yes. Okay. Because okay. of cord killing. That's that the, the reason why that number was so high was because everybody who got cable had to pay for ESPN, whether sure. or not you watched it. And sure. the, the reality of, of, of cable declining is ESPN just makes less money, a lot less money. At this stage, the only people that can actually just pick and choose whatever they want to buy are the tech companies. Yep. Apple, Amazon. Maybe Google if they want to get into it, although that they're not nearly on the same level well, as YouTube Apple and TV, Amazon. I got that NFL Sunday ticket. Absolutely. So dabbling, for sure. So, I mean, that's more the dabbling, really, yeah. Yeah, and, and on the board now are a lot of very big brands, brands that, that actually matter for uh, the world of entertainment and in news and in sports. A uh, Apple spent a lot of money on MLS and then talked – Lionel Messi to play in a closet in Fort Lauderdale so they can monetize the, the, the rights package. They are willing yeah. to spend. The question for me is who does Apple buy? Who does Amazon buy? And then mm -hmm. from the remainders, which old Hollywood conglomerate essentially binds together? Apple doesn't buy things as often as people want them to buy things. So I'm always resistant to people saying Apple should buy this. Apple should buy this. Apple should buy Netflix. Apple's never going to buy yeah. Netflix. Netflix didn't want to sell itself. I never bought that. But there is a world where Apple buying Disney does make sense. It's the exception that proves the rule. I'm, I'm still 50, 50 on it. But I'd say if Apple were to buy anything big, they might buy smaller things. But if they were to able buy, to buy anything big, it would be Disney. Uh, otherwise, I think they go for small fish uh, and, and contracting. But Apple would love to have all that intellectual property. They would love to have the ESPN sports streaming rights that they could then use in yes. their own products. Uh, yeah, I guess we'll see. 
Tom, yeah. January. We need a, we need a name for this. We need like like a patent wars or something yeah. kind of yeah. uh, <laughs> name because there's gonna be a lot of these stories. Uh, Gen Pocalypse. I don't know. We'll work on Gen Pocalypse. Working title. I, I, think I, 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 yeah. I think I knew her in college, Jan Pocalypse. She's <laughs> Jan nice. Pocalypse, oh, yeah. Right. You remember her. Yeah. She, she went to fine. St. Kitts. She yeah. just kind of ruined every party, but... Because yeah. <laughs> she was always consolidating oh, everything. Oh, right, right, right. Um, mm. Yeah. Well, uh, your, your, naming, uh, your naming nominations accepted at uh, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. I think, I think I'm going to call Paramount Plus first of all. Par- or not Paramount Plus, Paramount. Paramount will be the first to fall. It's, there'll be a lot more talk about Warner Brothers Discovery, but I, mm. be- I bet somebody snaps up Paramount, and I bet it's going to be somebody unexpected like Amazon or something. I wouldn't doubt it. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. This one comes in from Colin, a film producer and director who wrote in about our discussion with Charlotte Henry from Monday Show about horror movies and how horror movies might be uh, money makers uh, in in their own way. Colin says, "You're right. Horror generally is a smaller money making business. They cost less because they make less. There's they also require lesser stars to be marketable, largely because there is an established audience for horror as a genre." Crucially, though, this makes it easier to put together and fund a horror project, especially as an independent producer. Making a big sci-fi project, for instance, is effectively impossible independently. If you make a drama, it'll never be distributed without A-list talent, and you'll never get them. So horror is a realistic business model, meaning you get more horror movies from more diverse sources than many other genres. Colin goes on to say, however, there is a degree to which horror is a filmmaker genre. Horror movies Hmm. call for more stylistic work from the camera and image than a typical rom-com, for instance. I've made quite a few rom-coms, says Colin. In horror, you get to paint with bolder cinematic strokes. Directing a rom-com, you're working on performance to get the nuance of a relationship just right. Directing horror, I get to try to make you afraid of a doorway. It's fun. Oh, that's so great. Colin, thank you so much uh, for sharing your insights on this. I this love is really that. Fascinating. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Very good. Uh, we also Norway. got an email from Jason. That was scary. Jason wrote in uh, <laughs> about the scariness of ad blockers uh, and said, I support ad based content. <laughs> the, one of the reasons I picked this email is he's one of the few people who took that position. I support ad based content. With that said, my home network is protected by a pie hole ad blocker. It does not block YouTube ads, but it does block many of the obnoxious and questionable ad networks. Some of the ad networks are accidentally or otherwise distributing malware or malicious software that doesn't get caught by antivirus software and lands on your computer to initiate downloading more nefarious software. I have a budget of $30 a month to spend on Patreon and gladly pay for great content. Ah, Jason, that's music to our ears, of course. Uh, Thank you for that. And, and yes, this is a great point that Jason wasn't the only one to make, but one of the reasons people block ads that we didn't talk about on the show was malicious ads. It's not as big of a deal now as it used to be. In fact, one of the, the patrons was commenting, like, it's kind of weird that the success of targeting has made ads safer over the years, uh, which is an interesting point. But but yeah, uh, there are still malicious ad networks out there. And what Jason's doing is blocking those while letting legitimate networks in, which means YouTube doesn't get blocked because YouTube is not using those malicious ad networks in this case. Hmm. Well, uh, you know who isn't malicious? Justin Robert Young. Mm, uh, let yeah, folks know sure. where they can keep up with your work when you're not with us, Justin. Well, you can download Know a Little More. Uh, the season that we've been working on for the last few months is coming to a close. One more episode after this. But you can listen to Tom explain so many things this season on Know a Little More. Go ahead and check it out. <laughs> This week's episode is about authenticator apps, uh, and it was suggested by Big Jim, uh, the, hey. the, uh, the trade nerd. Uh, he's like, wait, how does this thing know that my code is right if it's not using the internet? So I'm like, huh, that's a good question. Uh, and I, I researched it and found it out. So thank you, Jim, uh, for that. And uh, <laughs> everybody else gets to benefit from that answer at knowalittlemore.com. Yeah. You, uh, you found out, Tom. You found I out. I did. 
I yep. effed around the internet until I found out. <laughs> And then you found out, yeah, uh -huh. which is which is the point. Uh, <laughs> just a reminder: you can catch this. Show oh wait, live. wait, wait! Patrons, pat I almost forgot. Oh, patrons, oh, ah! uh, patrons <laughs> should stick around uh, for Good Day Internet because we're going to talk about that new Beatles song Ooh. that they used machine learning to complete. It's the last Beatles song they promised this time, uh, and they used machine learning. Is that a good well, idea? Well, they promised we'll it about. last time, yeah. but you know, I know. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, just a reminder, our show is live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we'll be back tomorrow talking about the UK's role in the ongoing AI debate with Nate Langson joining us. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs>